You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 121. The writing is the only progress you make. Ernest Hemingway. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Now guys, today on the show, we have author and writer Jamie Nash, who is the author of Save the Cat Writes for TV, the last book on creating binge watching content you'll ever need. And I have to say, after reading this book, I completely agree. If you're a fan of Save the Cat, which is the most popular, best-selling screenwriting book of all time, then you're going to love this book. Jamie goes deep into the step-by-step approach using Blake Schneider's principles. In this conversation, we talk about the eight Save the Cat TV franchise types that will improve your story and your pitch, the not-so-secret TV pitch template, how to write and structure a compelling TV pilot that can launch both your series and your TV writing career, and much, much more. We also break down a ton of different TV pilots and discuss some of our favorite shows and why they are so amazing. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Jamie Nash. I'd like to welcome to the show Jamie Nash. Man, how you doing, Jamie? I'm doing great. Thanks for having. Thanks for coming on the show, brother. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm a big fan. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. We're here to talk about your new book, Save the Cat: Rights for TV. And I am a huge Save the Cat fan. Uh, I've had uh, multiple different authors who've written different Save the Cat books on as well because I, I, you know, look. A lot of people. Some people are like, oh, it's a formula and. It doesn't, you know, it's like, oh, it's taking all the creativity out of it. And you know what? For some people, that might be the truth. But other Mm -hmm. people, it's not. So I always like to present every kind of system, way, structure that you can because you just never know what writer is going to connect with what person. I remember when I saved the – I read for Save the Cat for the first time. I was just completely blown away. And I was just like – I was young early in in my screenwriting career. And there's a reason why it's still one of the best-selling – if not the best selling, it, it is the best selling. By the way, I have, yeah. my book can't even knock it off its perch. So you know, I mean, it's we're we're number two a lot of times, staring right at it. And I'm like, can we pass it for one day? And it's how old now? How long has that been around? Uh, 2007. So it's been around for a couple years now, uh, and it's still it, so. There's obviously some sort of value there uh, because there's been a lot of screenwriting books between 2007 and now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. and and it's still there. So, um, how did you? Uh, I was reading a little bit before our, our conversation. You knew, you met Blake back in the day. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I'm in Maryland, and, and if you know, most of my career is spent doing indie horror movies, especially back in those days. Um, and somewhere along the line, I was trying to network 
over the internet back in the, you know, the 2000 internet, like 2003, 2004 internet. And I, I remember I met him through a writing group. Um, there was some kind of writing group. I don't, I, I can't remember how they met him, but he was there and he actually wanted me to write a script with him. He had seen that I had sold wow. some stuff. I was just starting my career. And, uh, he kind of came to me and said, you know, I like your sense of humor. You have a good, uh, handle and structure. And, uh, he had this idea for a script and he pitched it to me and he was, he, even though his days were a, probably a few years before that, like the nineties were his heyday, you know, he sold, I had, think he had $2 million script sales. Of yeah. course he infamously wrote stop or my mom will shoot. That's how he broke into Hollywood. Um, so he, he hadn't, I'm not sure if he had sold anything in the last couple of years, but to make a long story short, he, he asked me to write a script with him and I, I met him that way. And that was prior to save the cat. Um, uh, and I, I mentioned this in the book, he was using the save the cat terms on me. And I just thought they were like standard Hollywood terms. Like he, he wasn't doing it in the way the book does it. He was just like, you know, we need an all is lost moment here, or we need, uh, in the debate section, and he was using these terms, and I was like, "Oh, this is just the way, you know. Maybe, maybe he just got this jargon through, you know, talking to producers and stuff right. like that." But I, I, so I almost organically processed that stuff even b- before the book came out, just through him uh, talking through that kind of stuff. So that's how I met him. That must have been that must have been pretty cool, and yeah, man, that must have been awesome uh, coming up. But so, how did you get into the business? Yeah. So I was a computer science major. That's how I got into business. Now, I, I was a computer science major. I always loved film. Uh, I was doing computer games at the time, but programming them, nothing really that creative. I always thought programming would lead me to the creative side. It never really did. It, <laughs> it was a different kind of creativity. I was always like, yeah, and then one day I'll make my adventure game and I'll put my stories in there. And that never happened. <laughs> um, so so I wrote on this side uh, and and probably in the early 2000s, I started to write screenplays. Uh, and the first one, I I sold a script called Altered with Eduardo Sanchez. It was Eduardo Sanchez, the, you know, your listeners will know, the Blair Witch Project, one of the Blair Witch Project directors. Mm-hmm. And that was his first movie after Blair Witch. Um, and Universal picked it up. Um, and then Universal kind of buried it. Uh, in some ways, it was a straight to DVD uh, still to this day, people find it now. It came out, I think, 2006, 2007 ish. Mm-hmm. And people find it to this day and are like, I've never heard of this movie. It, you know, it, it has a lot of fans that just right. pick it up and find it and, uh, and, and enjoy it. But that was my intro to the business. Um, I made some good money. I kept programming because I was like, you know, I'm not, it's not enough money. It's not going to change my, my programming ways. Um, but then after that, made some more movies. Got a lot of indie gigs. I was really, I was really this weird indie screenwriter. Um, I, I was doing, and honestly, I think it was because I was cheap. Um, I wasn't in the WGA yet. Um, I wrote really fast. Um, I was game for anything. I, I just loved to write and make movies. And uh, I, I was, you know, when I compare myself to what I do today, what it taught me, because I did finally go um, full time. I went full time in 2008 when the market kind of crashed mm-hmm. and I got laid off from my um, Citigroup gig. And uh, at the time I was I was a computer consultant for Citigroup. Um, not that I was laid off. They were just like, we're not making any money. We're not going to hire any of you consultants back next year. You get paid too much. And um, at that point, I said, I'm going full time. Um, and a couple years after that, so it's been since 2008, I've been a full time screenwriter. Um, and probably That's around two, yeah, in 2011, I finally got in the writer's guild. Uh, so, and what, I, what the point I was going to make was when I was an indie writer, I had to write like 10 screenplays a year just to make a little bit of money to survive. Like I had to write so many screenplays and do so many gigs because the, you know, I didn't have all those guild protections of minimum salary, residuals, all that stuff. And then once I got in the guild, my muscles were in a way that I was just used to writing 10 screenplays a year. So, so I'm kind of a nut in that I write about five, usually like five to six scripts a year or something, pilots, um, television shows, podcasts, I'll write novels. And probably since that time I've been doing it, you know, screenwriting full time, uh, but now on the WGA. 
That's awesome, man. That's a, yeah. that's you're you're a, you're a unicorn. You mean someone who's I, a I, full time screenwriter? Like that's I'm a full time screenwriter, unicorn, and also I'm in Maryland, which makes it even weirder. Right, exactly, and and that's the thing that a lot of screenwriters listening think that the only way you can make a living is if you're Shane Black, Aaron Sorkin, uh, or Tarantino, where you know you, you're getting million dollar paydays. Um, but there are, and I've had on the show many. Just workmen, craftsmen, just people, screenwriters who are just, you know, cranking out work, you know, job for job, you know, and making a good living and supporting their family. But they're just working as opposed to like this one and done lottery ticket mentality, which so many screenwriters get into the business with. Yeah, I mean, you're the title of your show, your podcast. That's that was my life. Uh, <laughs> it was indie film hustle. Uh, I mean. <laughs> I legitimately, I, I had to do 10 scripts a year because I don't know that I did 10. I'm, I'm using that number. It was more like five or something. You know? It's still a lot. It's still yeah, a lot. It, was, it was crazy. And, and to this day, I, I get anxiety if I don't produce that many in a year. Um, and it's basically, like you say, the Shane Blacks of the world, not even the Shane Blacks, but the L.A. folks, they have a different game they're playing where they have lots of meetings. Um, they're, they're networking every day. They live and breathe it. But for me, I'm constantly feeling the need to remind people I exist. And the way I do it is by writing. Uh, So I'm constantly saying, look, I'm here. I got a new thing. And I'm meeting people. Like after it goes out, then I meet people, talk to them. uh, And so that's my life. So your your networking technique is to actually create content and create projects. Yes. Wow, yes. what a what a what a, what a what a what a concept! As opposed to just doing yeah. one script that took you seven years to make to write, and hoping that that's the one that's going to break you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely. Uh, I, I'm not sure that any, everybody can pull it off, um, mm-hmm. but it's the only way I've known to really pull it off. And then when you get one friend, that friend is where you get most of your work. To be honest, so yeah. Eduardo Sanchez is a good example. Um, I did a lot of work with Nickelodeon. So the weird thing is I'm a horror person and a kid person. Like they're the two Opposite biggest spectrums. arenas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I've done tons of scripts with Nickelodeon and I did tons of horror scripts. Um, and uh, once you find that person that really wants to champion you and likes your work and, and sees it, then they become the majority of your stuff. But I've sold over the years. I mean, it's crazy all the different places because we had a script at Blumhouse at one point, which is obvious. But then I also had something at like Discovery. Uh, you know, I had a pitch that I sold to Discovery at one point. I've had stuff at Amazon Prime um, all over the place. Yeah, you know? yeah. So that's awesome, man. That's awesome. So you sat down and wrote a book called Save the Cat Rights for TV. Yes. And right now, arguably television and stream. And when you say television, I use streaming is is, is all yeah. all encompassing television yeah. and streaming. Um, it is probably the most lucrative and easy, I can't say easiest, but yeah. <clears throat> you have a better chance of making a living in the television streaming world than you do off of independent films uh, only because it's, I mean, when you were coming up independent films, there was money to be made. Now mm-hmm. it's it's a lot different world we live in. Now the money's in streaming. So that's why I wanted to have you on the show because I feel so many screenwriters who've been, who've been, you know, just hacking away at the the independent film script, which is fine, and you can definitely keep doing that, are starting to transition. You're like, you know where I think streaming and television, I might want to start trying to get into the writer's room. I might start trying to develop my own show, and all that kind of stuff. So first question I have for you is, what are a few questions a writer needs to ask themselves when developing a show? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I have this kind of, magic formula in the book that it's, it's the first section of the book. By the way, the book will take you from A to Z and I I should define what Z is super quick is um, because like you said, um, you, you put it perfectly. The number of jobs in the WGA television to film, if you do the comparison, they do a report every year. And the last I saw, this isn't the exact numbers, but it's super close. It's ballpark. I should have looked up the exact numbers is I think of 9,000 jobs, 7,000 plus are in television. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's super skewed toward television. 
And it makes sense because they're writers' rooms and all these other things. Right. It's more, more jobs, just more jobs. More jobs. Tons of, tons of streamers. Each show has, you know, five to 12 writers. They're in rooms. They get jobs. Um, so, which is part of the reason why we did this book, why we did this Rights for Television book. So, the thing my book really tries to push is the reason you write uh, a television pilot. And it's really concerned with pilots. So that's what I said, A to Z. A, you start with nothing. Um, Z, you end up a pilot. Uh, a, when I say a pilot, a pilot story, a save the cat outline, you know, you'll have the outline ready to go. All you have to do is get in final draft and crank out the fun stuff. Um, a TV show pitch and a TV show concept. So you could pitch your show or you could send the pilot in. Um, either one would work. And um, so when a writer is considering doing television, what my pitch to you is, or to your listeners, is you need a pilot. A pilot is the key thing you're going to need because really you're not, one goal is to sell the show. That is one goal. But if you want one of those TV writers jobs, uh, if you want to get in one of those rooms, right now they're asking for original um, scripts. So, you know, back in the day and, you know, when I was coming up, they would ask you for spec uh, scripts, which were like an episode of Friends, for example. You just write like episode 203 of Friends, you know. Um, Nowadays, nobody wants that. And I, you know, I pulled a lot of people just to make sure because I considered putting that section in the book. And I so I went out to my, you know, showrunner friends, my friends that are on staff. And they say nobody writes those anymore. There's some fellowships that actually take them. So it's not true. There are unicorns that still ask for them. There's like the one in 100 that say, we want to see your friend's script to mm-hmm. decide if you're going to come in to writer's room. But most people are looking for pilots. Some will take features and some will take plays, but 99% of them take pilots. You know, like pilots is what you need. So the book is really focused on the fact, hey, you might want to get one of those TV jobs. Hey, you might you might try to write a pilot. So that said, to kind of backtrack, to write a good pilot, to write a great pilot, you need a good show. So that was, this is your question. So what are the things in a show that you really need? And from my experience, and then from research as well, I came up with the three big things. These are the three. Um, A unique world is really important. Um, There are some like stand-up comics and stuff that their point of view is kind of the world, you know, like uh, Seinfeld. It's a show about nothing, so to speak. Yeah. But his unique view of it, his comedy is kind of the world. But for the most part, you're trying to find some kind of world that you know and that's authentic to you. Because, again, these are writer samples that you're trying to get a job with. So your script needs to say something about you. So it has to be something you love. Yeah, you know, um, in the book, I give examples of things I love. I love pro wrestling. You know, I love uh, street performing. I love computer programming. You know, these are things I love and I could speak about. I could talk about. I I love to research. So can Um, we so so can we can we do a pilot that is a pro wrestler who's also a street performer and and codes on the side? I've done it. I've gotten that. (laughs) I've got four of those pilots. uh, I've got those four pilots. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I've got all of them. The funny thing you say, I, here's the weird thing. I've done two of those, those worlds for pilots, but the programming one, which seems the most obvious and the most relatable, I haven't figured out a fun uh, take on that. It's, it's, I mean, Uh, I saw Silicon Valley is a great, and it's not coding per se, but that's it, but it was so wonderfully done. I mean, Silicon Valley was, was wonderfully, wonderfully done. That's the thing between that and halt and catch fire. Yeah. I I don't need to do, I'm a huge halt and catch fire person and I love Silicon Valley. So what am I going to add to that? I can't find the fresh perspective. One day I'll find it. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so, so world is the first part. Um, and then when I was going to pitch, the first thing you learn in television at every meeting, you'll pitch this great thing and they'll tell you, they'll sit you down, they'll say, what we really care about is character, 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 character. It's all about character in television. Um, it's who you want to invite onto your DVR every single week. It's all about character. And they always say to put character first. Um, and I, I have trouble. I'm a plot first guy. I'm kind of a concept first guy. You know, mm-hmm. I came up, 
uh, loving the Shane Black kind of stuff. You know, Die Hard is kind of my movie. So I'm a concept first type person. But I really had to over the years, especially over the last, I don't know, six years. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I really kind of reinvented myself to try to think character first almost, or that's try to try to really get at what pulls at my heartstrings and what engages my own personal story and emotions in the script. So character is part two. And then the last one is, and this is another term I never heard till I got to Hollywood. Um, the term was somebody would say, what's the franchise? That would be the first question you'd get. And to me, it was a really cheesy kind of question, like a guy with a cigar would be, yeah, what's the franchise, kid, or something. <laughs> um, but it, it was a term that was regularly used. And what it meant was story engine. What's the thing that if you put, you know, if you kind of sit there every week and you say, we need a story idea, what's the inspiration for it? What's the con- where does the conflict come from? Where do the goals, where do the heroes come from? And it's that franchise. That's the thing. So in my in the book, just to give you an example for a franchise, uh, I came up with these and Blake Snyder came up with these things called genres uh, in his in his uh, first book. And genres were basically story patterns. They were recurring stories we'd see over time. So he has like buddy love might be buddy cop or romance. He had um, he had a golden fleece, which might be like a quest movie, or it might be a um, sports movie for, you know, you're trying to win the trophy. You're trying to win something. Um, monster in the house. That was my favorite. Yeah. It was fish, is it fish out of fish out of water. I think it was something. Or, or. Fish out of, there's there, I do think he has a, a true fish out of water. Um, he has a full triumphant as, yeah. as one that he has. Um, so there are ones that kind of become fish out of water, but I don't think he has one. Um, but he has a whole bunch. There, yeah. there, I'm trying to remember the number exactly. I think there's 10. There might be 12. Um, I should know. They're in my book, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- so there's a bunch of them. And they were the they were the stories. So I came up with something similar, which is the franchises. I, I kind of went through and I identified all the types of franchise types to help you figure out your show. Um, and just you could probably come off up with these just like you came up with Fish Out of Water. Like that's a recurring theme. Um you know, TV shows, there's the procedural shows. I call yeah. those blank of the week. Um, they're my blank of the week shows. So okay. it could be anything from uh, X-Files, you know, monster of the week to CSI, which might be case of the week to uh, house, which might be patient of the week or something like that. So that's one type of franchise um, trapped together. So they're, they're family shows. You're, you know, you're or the office space shows. Um, so you're in an office, you're trapped with these people around you. The conflict and the reoccurring stories come from those people and the interplay and the social dynamics. Um, and so I came up with a bunch of these, much like he had genres. And the way I suggest, so there are the three things I think you come up with. I honestly think you start with the world. Like, what are the worlds you love? Then say, who are the characters that really compel you in those worlds and make a big list? You know, in in Silicon Valley, you know, you have the CEO, you have the kind of you have the guy who runs the uh, the incubator. You have you have all these things and you, you write those down and you have all your characters. And then if you start applying to the franchise type, you know, is this a is this a trap together? Is this a is this a uh, blank of the week? You know, and then you can kind of brainstorm the kind of show you're creating through those three main pillars that you're creating. So what are the, so what are the, so we have a blank of the week, we have trapped together. Are there any other ones? There are. So a lot of the modern serialized shows, so blank of the week, they're kind of the old, you know, episodics. Right. Um, there's, um, there's a, a dude with a series long problem or season long problem. Uh, like so bre- breaking bad, breaking bad or, or somebody that like 24 or something like that. Right. Right. Um, there's um there's one called um man or woman with a plan. Um so it's somebody almost like like the show Revenge. Remember the show Revenge? Uh or something where somebody's like uh they have a plan and they're gonna they're going to enact it. 
Um, mm-hmm. There's buddy love. So some of these are similar to the genres because they tell stories over time. And does this tra- um, and does, does this trans uh, uh, this go from comedy to drama to action? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So so much like the genres, um, the genres, uh, the Blake Snyder genres, which are very they're like cousins to these franchise types. A monster in the house, just as an example. So a monster in the house is usually like a person trapped in a scenario with some monster. But something like What About Bob or Cable Guy, they're not horror movies, but they're still patterns that are similar to Fatal Attraction or something like <laughs> yeah, that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, what about um, Bob? <laughs> yeah. And so uh, one of my – one of the examples I give in the book is uh, – is, is dude or dudette with a series long pro- problem or a season long problem is the good place. And that's a comedy, mm-hmm. but um, it could also be Homeland, uh, you know, or something like that. It, so it, it, they definitely cross genres. They're really just speaking to where you're going to co- find the conflict week to week, you know, and it, they, they help you kind of brainstorm uh, what your show is, but they also help you brainstorm what your pilot will be. And they also help you brainstorm what the season might look like. Got you. And and obviously, so like the procedural, like, you know, blank of the week, that is more network television yeah. kind of world. That's not as much the streamers. I mean, of course, there's always crossover. There, there's exceptions. The one place you might see it in the streamers is animation. Uh, when you get the animation, some of those are like, like Rick and Morty or something like that. Uh, <laughs> they can be serialized um, for sure. I, I mean, Rick and Morty isn't a streamer, but they have a, a big mouth or, you know, some shows like that. Maybe well, not so, BoJack. Or South, South, well, Park. South Park, but that's more, that's Comedy yeah, Central. No, yeah. South Park's a South Park's a good example. Again, it's, it's network, but it's kind of streaming too. Um, right, exactly. But, when I say network, it, it's the four big ones. That's that's Absolutely. what that's what I'm thinking like, is NBC, like ABC, Big CBS, Bang and Fox, Fury or you know yeah. something like that. Uh, they're definitely uh, those procedurals, those television like Hawaii Five O, you know things like that. Uh, they're definitely in the blank of the week category or even the trap together category. Yeah, and I, that's the one thing I've not really I've never seen a Hawaii Five O or 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 that or or CSI in a streamer yeah. world. It, it doesn't yeah. it, it doesn't really exist originals obviously yeah. after the fact but never originals because i've because of the pandemic have been uh, consuming quite some quite a good amount of television lately and we yeah, just yeah. it's just sit and i just absorb like i just I, finally went back to handsmaid's tale uh, i hadn't oh, yeah. fi- i hadn't finished it yet because i got pissed off when they caught her again i was like i can't i can't i can't take that, it that's how i was i got to season two i love season one yeah I oh, was fantastic. Season two, I was like this fantastic. is great and i was like i can't it's got to go forward somewhere. I can't take. And it when anymore. they pulled her, when they pulled yeah. her back out, I was like, I'm out. I can't. Yeah. But then I'm like, I, okay, no, they've got same. three seasons. So they got, I got basically the third season, and then as of this recording, the fourth season starts. I think you know, Friday. You, know, you and I are the exact same one. <laughs> I, it's so funny. I took and, I, literally when they pulled her out of the, 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 the uh, spoiler alert. Season um, one was like my favorite uh, show when it was on. I loved it. I was like, this is great. And then and, season two, I'm like, I still love it. And then once it got to the end, I was like, I don't know if I want to watch season three. I, I can't. I can't. The, and, and just a, a perfect example, Walking Dead. Like Walking Dead, I was a huge Walking Dead fan. So me the same. Yeah. And once Negan showed up. Right. right. That's, once yeah. Negan showed up, that whole season was so abusive to the audience, I felt. Yeah. It just, yes. you can't beat the characters you love to a pulp and never give them a win. It was just kind of like you were just seeing your favorite characters never win. And this Negan was this, he was a villain that was so, so, so un, uh, the villain can never be un, 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 unconquerable. If you, if you create a villain yeah. that's unconquerable, then there's no hope. And that's what I felt in, in Walking Dead. And then I stopped watching. I hadn't seen it since that last season. Yeah, at the very end, I, I there's a, something, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was a comic book Walking Dead person. So I read all the comic book. Yeah. Um, and the comic book is easier to digest because it's it's not as much story. You know what I mean? Even though yeah. it takes place, there's just not as much of it. It's not as mm. much. So Negan's great. I love Negan in the comic book. His, You're absolutely right, though. He's like undefeatable. He's always two steps ahead. He always finds a way out. He's, he's definitely a tricky character. I think it's kind of the Lost syndrome as well there. When Lost got into those middle years and it just didn't feel like, they were allowed to move forward. 
They jumped the shark. They jumped. The, they jumped the shark. It, yeah. Like if, yeah. if we if we can go back to the old concept of jumping the shark. Absolutely. Um, for anybody who doesn't know what jump the shark actually means, is from an old episode of Happy Days when Fonzie literally jumped the shark in his motorcycle, yeah. and we all said, "Okay, you've gone too far." Yeah. <laughs> I think the season before it was, it was a cliffhanger episode, and the season before he jumped like a bunch of barrels right <laughs> so that, like that. that was fine so in the next episode they had the top next year they topped it he was in he was in la he jumped some sharks they were doing the whole evil can evil thing it was just bizarre so <laughs> jump- just, and that's where <laughs> and that's where jump the shark comes from but yeah that's it's, a, it's just really interesting in regards to uh television because i've i mean i've consumed obscene amounts of television in my, in my in my lifetime and now this last year i mean we just literally just go searching like we we just finished we just caught up with um uh this is us and watched yeah. all of this is us like and cried a lot, uh, <laughs> but it's so the pilot is in my book. So I, it's I'm a big such Google. such an amazingly written shot show to be able to work multiple timelines, the same characters at different ages, the 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 plotting that's involved with that. Yeah, it's it is on something I've I've really on a whole other level. I've just there's never been a show like it. The, the pilot is a great example, too, oh. of what people should be doing in their pilots. Yes. Because not to spoil it, but it, it's been out a while. And it's the first look, episode. spoiler alert, if everybody yeah. doesn't want to know, just I'm sorry. Yeah, this that's absolutely. So this is us. Um, it does this thing where it's kind of a mystery. You don't realize how the characters are totally connected. So you're doing the math the whole episode. And then in the very final, like, seconds of it, it shows you how they're all connected and it and does it, this like magic trick and it blows, and it blows your, mind. your mind. So yeah. you could just watch the pilot episode of this is us, turn it off and sort of be satisfied with the show. It's like mm-hmm. a mini movie unto itself. It's, it's really a great, a great episode. And it was used, a movie by the way. It started it, as a movie. Script. It did it. Oh, did the script started as a movie? Which that, which that which I've that never read sense. it, but I know it did. But that, that's the thing. And that technique they use constantly throughout the series, you'll they'll be introduced to brand new characters Yes. No, and in weird time frames, you don't even know what time of what the history, what historical time they're much, in. Much like Lost, much like Lost, it, right? The exactly. blue minds when they did it. Yeah. yeah, you're just like, what? What's going on? And then you just like these weird characters, and then at the end, you're just like, and then my wife and I would be sitting there going, like, where? Who are these people? Like, how are they connected? Like, where? Where is this line gonna? When are yeah. they gonna meet? And you're just like, oh, and I, I don't want to ruin it, but I just saw the one with the um. Uh, the guy with the internet uh, who helped start the internet. And there was like this, the whole, the whole series, you saw this family and going through it. And there was one of the guys who actually in, in, did the internet and created FaceTime and has how they connected right, and all that right. stuff. I was just blown away. I was like, Oh, that's brilliant. It was so well. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the best written shows on television currently, I yeah. think. No. And, and like I said, I, that, so my book also uh, breaks down a bunch of pilots. Um, that's one of them. Uh, I, I, there's a there's a whole bunch in the book. I tried to give something for everybody. I have Rick and Morty's pilot. How there. about do you have Breaking Bad? I didn't do Breaking Bad. The, here's my the reason I didn't. I Could tried have... to only I tried to only do first of all a lot of people have done Breaking Bad. Right. And I, I mentioned Breaking Bad in my character section. There's a whole big thing about it. But I tried to only do shows that weren't yet canceled. Uh, so or finished, show, or, right. or, or, not finished, uh, canceled is a rough word, but I, I tried to do shows that we'd get another season next year. Just, it was strategic uh, just Fair for enough. longevity of the book. So, right. Exactly. So you're not going back to like Sopranos. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and then I think they announced like a week later, this is also in next year, but still I, I have one year before it will be. It uh, is going to, it is. I, this is news to me. They're ending it next year. Breaking news. Uh, there, though my wife and I have a theory that maybe one of these spinoff characters will just become some new iteration of This Is Us, like a new family or something like of that. Of course. Like they'll, it, they'll spin it, one off. They yeah. could absolutely spin that off and continue down Same model, road. different family, different stories. Oh, you know? yeah. You could absolutely, absolutely, absolutely do that. Now, one question I had. You, uh, you talk about a beat sheet. How do you actually use a beat sheet in creating a – in, in television, because I know how to do it in, in film, but how do you sure. do it in television? Sure. So what what I did in the TV, and honestly, my experience comes from the Blake Snyder beat sheet. I, I teach college students. I've taught uh, beat sheets and stuff, so I know it really well. And 
in recent years, a lot of my students come and say, hey, I don't want to write a feature. I want to do a pilot. Can I do it in your class? And I've, I've allowed them to do it. And over the years, I've learned some tricks. Uh, I've learned how it works and how it doesn't. How a lot of people that use the Save the Cat Beat Sheet, now, first I'll describe what the Save the Cat Beat Sheet is, I guess. Uh, the Save the Cat Beat Sheet is kind of this template that it spells out what should happen when in a movie uh, is, the, is the most crass way of saying it. Uh, so just as an example, I'll, I'll give through the first act just to give you a quick example. Um, you start with an opening image. That's like page one, the first thing. And it's usually some thematic image that shows, captures the tag, thematic or, or how the world is before the story starts. Usually it's bookended with a closing image on the end. And you'd be amazed in a film if you took opening and closing image of your films to see how there's a certain poetry there. How there's a certain bookendedness there. Um, so anyway, opening images first. Then you usually get a setup. The setup is all the things you'd think. It's like the character's homework and play, your main character, who your main character is, what their life is like before the story starts. Um, and that's the setup. And then you get to the catalyst, which is this lightning bolt moment that comes in. Like it's Peter Parker being bit by a spider. It's a meteorite crashing into the earth. It's some you know, some often random coincidence, some crazy thing that starts the story. It's meeting the the person you'll fall in love with in a rom-com. It's whatever that thing is. And that's the catalyst. And that happens on page 12, according to Save the Cat, the first book of a feature film. Um, so, and it goes on and on like that. There's a midpoint. That's, that's like, you know, at your 50% mark. There's the all is lost, which happens about 75%. And that's the worst thing that can happen. That's Obi-Wan Kenobi getting killed or your mentor dying or, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that point where you go into this woe is me thing because something horrible happened, which then is the dark night of the soul and the finale and everything else. So the 15 beats of the save, there's 15 beats in the save the cat beat sheet. Um, you can get his book and, and check those out. They're in my book. I completely describe. Uh, save the cat. You can skip over the original book and just go to my book. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure the Save the Cat people happen. will not be happy with that, but yes, no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, there's a lot. There's a lot you can get in both. Of, uh, you can do it either way. Either um, way, yeah, wait, you can get a lot. You can get a lot way, of both. Either way, you can, I, I'm sure Amazon has a buy two for cheap price right now absolutely. In, the, in the whole world. Absolutely, um, that's the Save the Cat people calling me right now on the phone. I, think. I understand. Um, I understand. <laughs> Um, so the, that's the beat sheet. It's, it's just kind of this thing. It's kind of like a fill in the blank. And again, these are all the most crass ways of saying it. Uh, it's a kind of fill in the blank template that you can go through and say, once I have this done, I'll have an outline for a movie. If I, mm. if I fill out all these sections, I'll, I'll have an outline for a movie. The problem is, and, and by the way, there's a save the cat writes a novel book mm -hmm. that's hugely popular. Um, cause those people are even, when I say those people, I'm one of them novel writers are even more resistant to somebody telling them, you know, here's a template than, um, film people are. Uh, and it's, it's hugely popular in the novel world and it's the exact same template, by the way, cause the, the template is really just a template on how to tell a good story. And, um, and it's really an adaptation of things that came before it. Whether right, it's journey, the Aristotle, or, uh, or Joseph Campbell, journey, yeah, uh, yeah, Sid Field, all, all those things. It's it's very similar to all of, all of those, but it has its own nuances and its own way of speaking the language. Its own language. It's a language, uh, sort of. Now, uh, with with opening like an opening scene of a pilot or a film, for that matter, uh, I, I I love one of the reasons I love. I mean, Breaking Bad arguably is probably one of the best written shows of all time. Um, that pilot though, it is, it is a fairly, it's a, it's a masterpiece. It really is. You give another 15 minutes and it's, it's, it's one of the best independent films ever made. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you do it, the yeah. opening scene, what, what's your feeling on, cause with the templates that you're laying out, the beat sheet you're laying down, the opening of that scene, and I'm a big fan of this, the opening of that movie is the end. And I yeah. love doing that because the audience is like, wait a minute, we, how did it, it just, they're, they're asking questions while you're going through it yes. and it's very powerful as a storytelling technique is that work inside the beat sheet somewhere it, it does uh so it, this and, and i that one and i'm trying to remember uh breaking bad because while i remember the beginning like 
I get mixed up later because it starts blending in with the other one. So it was when I, he it's so when he came when he comes out, it's like him coming out in his underwear he, in the middle of the desert. The yeah, he does he's, the Blair Witch video. Right, uh, that whole thing. And then I think it's ends with him pointing the gun at the camera, and then we cut to you know, a, a week or two later or earlier or something so, like that. So I th- the reason I ask, I'm not I never remember the the end of it because it blends with the whole season. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, but so, I remember the beginning. So the, so my understanding, if I re- and if I remember correctly, because I didn't just yeah, watch yeah. it yesterday, I think we catch up to that moment and then we continue. So that's, like so, that's generally – it never ends at that moment. It generally is like a place where you pick up and then you keep going. So it's kind of like a I, really nice engine. I was going to say, in a purest sense, then it is a perfect opening and closing image because we're bookending. You know, you're you're right. opening and closing on the same kind of thing. It's just the, that kind of thing. Um, one thing I realized when I watched a ton of television shows getting ready for this book, I found some things that a lot of shows did. And there's a thing I call the opening pitch. And it feels like the first two minutes, that teaser scene of almost every show is almost like something you could show up to an executive's office and just show them that two minutes. Like say, look, this is our show. What do you think? You know, what questions do you have? Um, uh, Breaking Bad does it in more of that teaser sort of way. Uh, Like, here's the coolest thing. We're going to give you mysteries and stuff to think about. Like, how did this guy in his underwear and this in this car in the desert and drugs and all that stuff? So they do it in that way. But something like The Mandalorian, for example, Mm -hmm. it gives you this mini movie at the beginning where he it, it shows his tools it shows how he fights it shows the it gives you star wars star wars star wars and you could just yeah. show that you know imagine if they showed that to us on youtube just that first you know that first teaser section in that mm-hmm. case it's longer than two minutes if they showed you that you'd be like i'm in i'm in oh i'm, I'm in and uh it, the opening pitch a lot of them are in character driven shows like insecure or even uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which is one of my favorite shows. Um, a lot of times you get the main character just talking like, like, here's who I am. I'm just going to pitch you me. Uh, so Insecure, uh, that starts with her uh, pitching herself to a bunch of kids. And like it pulls back and she's talking to kids in a school and they're like, what? You know, you're going too deep here. Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, she's at her wedding and she's giving her wedding speech. And she kind of pitches her heart, like who she is. And you see why she's funny. And it's like a stand-up routine. And you could almost just put that, like, here's who she is and to an executive on the desk and be like, that's that's who she is. So this opening pitch thing is something I definitely saw in the teasers, where you get that first two minutes to just kind of lean forward and say, this is our show. We're going to show it to you. Um, Rick and Morty, Rick and Morty, the first two minutes of that, is a random Rick and Morty adventure. It's almost like a James Bond thing, sort of like uh, it, he gets the kid gets woken up. They get taken on a spaceship. There's a bomb or something going off. Um, it's it's Rick and Morty in two minutes. It's like an episode of Rick and Morty in two minutes. So you find that this happens a lot in pilots. Like they that first two minutes they use so perfectly. And even in shows like um, network shows like Blackish was another show I I analyzed. Blackish is. It's a, like a montage, but it has the main character giving his point of view, like what what kind of the blackish thing means to him. Uh, and, and it's basically an overview of the whole show. It's like it's like a, uh, a teaser trailer for the whole entire show. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that, that's what I noticed about the opening pitch. Um, yeah. So you also talk a little bit about the wonky laws of pilot physics. What is that? Well, it, that, in, in some ways it was really – in some ways that's there. It's two parts. In some ways it's my catch-all for all these weird things like the opening pitch. Um, like there was another thing I noticed I called the whiff of change stated. Uh, so in, in pilots, you usually don't have full character arcs. But there's usually a change in, in almost all pilots. That might happen in episode two, three. Because if you change the character in every episode – they would be weird by, you know, the end of the season. They would be like, they keep changing. But most pilots change the character in some small way, like to make a commitment. So, um, sp- you know, there are some spoilers here for, I'll give you a couple quick spoilers for the Mandalorian. I think mm-hmm. 
most people know at the end of it's, that. It's, it's on them if they haven't seen it. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but at the end of that, you have this bounty hunter who lives by a code and he's touching fingers with baby Yoda. You know, it's like there's some change in the world that this bounty hunter is now going to protect. It's this minor change. And it usually happens around the last scene. But in other shows like like Justified or something, mm-hmm. an, an older show, um, Christian. you get the character literally asking a question, was I justified at the end of the show, like in a, in a shooting? Mm-hmm. Um, in, the, in shows like um, Barry, which is one of my favorites and I cover in the book with a, with a sheet, um, with a beat sheet, um, at the end of that, somebody comes up to him and, and they say, you know, I'm an actor. And he goes, I'm an actor too. He's gone from a hitman to an actor at the end of the show. And he states it. He actually says it. And it's amazing how many shows you'll see now when you watch at the end of the pilots, they say what the change is. <laughs> it's, they verbalize so, it. So um, they actually, so the character, so for, to use as an example, um, you start off, James Bond starts off in the pilot as, a mild mannered, whatever, uh, you That's know, right. and then at right. the end of the pilot, I am now, a, I am now a special, a secret agent. And then yeah. the show takes off from there. Now this is his adventures as a secret agent. And of course he does change hopefully throughout the series somewhat depending on the show, obviously, because some of these procedural yeah. shows, these characters never change. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's- yeah, no, but you got it exactly right. So whatever his arc is in that first episode, which kicks off the show, um, and it's not always. This is why it's wonky. Yeah. But um, almost it's so it happens so often that I I wonder if a memo went out uh, because <laughs> you'll see it so often. But I think what it really points to is when you're writing your own pilots. While a TV show doesn't change a character, you know, every episode, your pilot should. Your pilot should have that movement. And the, and the reason I think that's the case, your pilot almost needs to be cathartic um, by itself. It needs to almost stand alone a little bit. Like you right. could just go back to watch that Mandalorian episode oh. and say, Oh, baby Yoda and this and that. Um, yeah. and you could watch it almost in a vacuum and never watch another thing again. It has a beginning, middle end. There's a change in the character. You get the feeling it's a pitch for the show. You're like, but, Oh, but there I know is, what show but there, there could be continuing adventures is the thing. Absolutely. So the story itself is solid. And yes. when he touches baby Yoda, Arguably, Mandalorian could just okay. He you could stop right there and go. Well, obviously, he just returned the, the baby Yoda to the proper people, and that's the end of the story. Or yeah, we've and built that's what why I call it the the whiff of change as opposed to a character arc. I, it's not total character arc. It's usually a question. And um, in in a movie, I, I think it's very equivalent in a movie to when the character commits to that first act break. Uh, mm-hmm. in, in the first act break, a lot of times. Like Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, the whole time he's like, I can't go. I got to help with the blue milk farm or whatever he's doing. <laughs> there. Uh, it's, it, it, it's a, it's a, what is it? Oh moisture. God, it's a, it's a, a moisture, a moisture, uh, was it moisture? Soon, basically. Farm, like I, a I like moisture. the blue milk farm. I think that would have been a lot. Cooler. I actually like the blue milk farm but as well. When I reboot it, it's going to be a blue milk farm. They're going to have blue cows. <laughs> it's going to be there. Uh, so by the time his parents are, you know, or his parents, his aunt and uncle are, um, killed and realizes what? there's spoiler alert split. spoiler, spoiler alert. Star Wars. <laughs> um, there's and his home's burnt he kind of looks and he's like he has that slight whiff of change he's going on an adventure um now the only thing i'd say to a pilot they almost say what the change is they almost physically ver- they almost verbalize it um mm-hmm. it, that's that's the amazing thing but usually there's that slight change where they've gone from a uh, moisture farmer to adventure by the end and they make some commitment and that that'll be the rest of the series that'll be the season you're watching and and mandalorian did it so beautifully because and they did it without words they did it with an yes. image yeah and it was like this hard ass just militant samurai of of of, of the universe <laughs> for a moment softened when he saw and connected with this little creature who we yeah. all just were like our minds exploded when we saw Baby Yoda. And you're just like, oh, this character's changed forever just because of – and that motion of him touching the finger, all of that is – like I'm getting chills. Damn it. Damn you, John Favreau. Um, but it's, it's true though. By the way, 
Mandalorian pilot is also broken down in my book. It was one of the ones I chose. And Smart. <laughs> this, yeah, to backtrack to the thing you said, Mandalorian has a hint of serialization yeah. for a streamer. It, it definitely has a mission of the week quality, kind of a throwback to the 80s almost. It, it actually it has like an A-team-ish vibe to it. <laughs> yeah, it. It has a serialized story running on the higher level. Sure. But, and, and it gets more serialized like toward the later episodes in each season. But it definitely has like – we got we to help this person. Yeah. Oh, no. It's literally like every episode like, OK, we're going to go break this guy out of jail. OK, we're going to go to this moon and we're going to go do this. Or we got to go to the to this this uh, this uh, base that we got to sneak into. Like every week it's something. And it literally leads itself to the next episode. That's, like absolutely. it's so beautifully done. Like what do we got to do now? Oh, well. Well, actually, it doesn't lead to the next episode. But it starts – so a lot of times he'll just be like fly, flying off into right. space. Right. And then the new episode like – Pick him up from space. Oh, we're gonna land on this planet. New adventure. We yeah, gotta we need, see. need some fuel. We need some. We need some blue milk. We, we need some. We need some blue, blue milk. milk. Oh, look, it's seven samurai. Okay, let's do seven samurai now uh, <laughs> on this planet, and it's it's great. No, it's 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 a wonderful show. I wanted to ask you something though. With with television, the old school way of television, where you had commercial breaks, there was a very specific style of writing, uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, plot point breaks. Um, or uh, that had to hit because commercials. So it's generally like a, f a five act. I think it was a five act. It, it, it the funny, generally a five, it, it really depends on the network you're on and the show. Um, right. It's, it's funny. They're actually heavily, heavily negotiated things. So the, you know, like if you were um, Vince Gilligan, you might be like, I only want four. There's no way I'm doing five. You know what I mean? And, and AMC's like uh, walking dead is, 10 or whatever, you know, Walking Dead is a ton. They just do a boom, boom, boom. They, oh, yeah. they put commercials all over the place. And he could say, but, well, we don't have zombies, damn it. So we're doing four. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And then, and then something like Mad Men, uh, I think the thing with that show was uh, the showrunner said, I'm not writing them in. You figure it out. And they, they had to figure it out. They had to go in and put ads in. So they come kind of abruptly in Mad Men. Um, but, when, but, when writing, but when writing a pilot, let's say um, – you because now yeah. there's many more streamers than there are I, network. My, my advice to people and people take this the hard way in some ways. I don't think they like hearing this necessarily. Mm -hmm. I don't think you have to write act outs at all on your pilots anymore. Uh, you can just totally forget about that for now. Once you're hired or once they buy your script, then you worry about it. But nobody's judging your script on your where you put your act outs or even if you know what they are. They're purely judging it on story. Um, and most, uh, and I won't even say most, almost everybody I talked to said, yeah, don't worry about the act outs. However, there are some people that like putting them in just because it's kind of like when people put smash cut in their feature, you know, it just feels something like smash cut to interior gym night, you know? And I think people like to put him in for that dramatic moment. Like it's almost uh, like what I say in my book, I always say write. You could write to them, uh, and I I feel like if you replace them with dun dun dun, you know, in your head, <laughs> and that works for you, then feel free to write to them because you, you really they they serve a valid um, they serve as a valid inspiration to write to these big cliffhanger moments and have five of those in your script and stuff like that. Like if that inspires you to write page a page turner, then put them in. Uh, or or put them in and then take them out in the end uh, if that inspires you. But you don't need them. Um, and if they give you any anxiety at all, like where should they go or should they be here or there, then I'd say take them out. I, I've written for shows that have them. And it's funny. When you get to production, uh, there that's when you get like the network version. Like on our network, we do it this way. And they're, they're very specific. Like you – it, when you're writing a pilot, the advice is you can put them wherever you want. So act one, it can be on page 12. It can be on page 10. It's your call. 20. You, you make it up. You're your own network when you write a pilot. But once you get into a phase where AMC buys your pilot, they have certain network rules. Like it might be act your act one act out must come between page 10 and 15. Mm -hmm. And if it's on page 15, you have to give at least six pages before the next one. Or, you know, they, they have certain rules that are unique network to network. Um, I would advise not worrying any bit about that until they pay you to worry about it. 
Because you don't know if your show's going to be on Netflix or Amazon Prime where they don't have ads or Hulu, which has ads but sort of doesn't or, you know, wherever. It kind of does. If you pay, you don't. It's it's the wild, wild west. Like before, I mean, for decades, it was pretty much the three, three, then four networks and television was just written that way and that was just the way it was. And then all of a sudden, uh, now it's literally a thousand different ways and thousand different approaches and a thousand different things that you can never. Can you imagine getting Breaking Bad on the air? It just never would have happened. Never would have happened. You know, shows shows like that would have never been able to get on anywhere else. Um, or Mad Men, you know, like that. Yeah. yeah. That that doesn't seem like a, a good. Well, Breaking Bad's arguably one of the worst pitches of in history. And Vince Gilligan says that's like it's a horrible, horrible pitch. I- I remember I, I didn't watch Breaking Bad at first. I mean, Me neither. Exception. Yeah, I was like, eh, it sounds like weeds. It's it's like <laughs> weeds a little bit. And I was like, I'm not going to I I loved weeds, but I was like, I saw weeds. I like her. I'm not sure that I like him. I, I, I actually I actually caught I caught it and I and I, I all the way up to the last five episodes. So the last five or six episodes I watched live. Okay. But, but we binged all the way up until then. So it was a great I way think to finish. Season it. two, I picked up on it somewhere in season two. Uh, oh, I so picked good. up on it. It's just but so, yeah. I mean, then I then yeah, I, uh, just, yeah, it is what it is. Um, uh, can you explain what a board is, and, sure. and and how do you use a board in, in the pilot? Is there a way to use the board in the pilot? Yeah, process? yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. So the board. It, this is what's kind of interesting about Save the Cat. So Save the Cat is mostly known for this fifteen point be cheap, right? But it introduced a lot of other cool concepts like um, write your log line before you write a script, you know, and things like that. Uh, the genres that we that we mentioned briefly. But one of the big things it had from day one was this thing called the board. And in a film, um, basically what the board is, it, it actually translates really well to television because they use boards like crazy in television. A board is just an index, a cork board. It could be a digital board. It's whatever you want to make it. But usually it's um I don't, I don't those aren't those uh, it's those index cards that sure. you can buy in a pack uh, you get them at the grocery store I think I buy one dollar is a hundred cards perfect for a movie or a TV show so for one dollar you can have your your movie mm-hmm. um by, by the way save the cat has pre printed ones now they they have like little fancy things to fill things out and I, I've seen uh, post it notes people use post it notes as well I, I use post it notes I'm a post it note guy it's just they're more disposable. I, I don't have a good board, so I just wall. use post yeah, yeah, you just put it on the wall and, and you just pop it in, pop and it out. basically, you write your scenes down on it. So, you know, let's say we were doing Breaking Bad. It might be like um, confessional scene. We might just jot down the basics of it. Confessional scene in the desert. Um, Walt thinks he's about to die. That'll be first card. Tack that up on the board. You know, second scene. Um, saddest breakfast in the world. He turns 50, bacon, <laughs> blah, 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 whatever. We tack that up on the board. And basically we construct an entire uh, show with these index cards. In a in a film, Blake's guidance was 40 cards. By the way, this this part was revolutionary to me. Even though I knew him, he, he told me this, and I didn't know what he was talking about. So when we were doing that script, he said, um, let's, okay, I think we're ready. I think we have our beat sheet. Let's do a 10-20-10. And I was like, what's a 10, 20, 10? I just assumed all writers, he made this up. I mean, he made it up. Let's do a 10, 20, 10. So what a 10, 20, 10 was, was, was 40 index cards. That's what he considered a feature film. Um, 10 were act one, uh, 20 were act two, and then 10 were act three. So act two, as you see, is twice as big as the other two. It really, it's four acts. That's the dirty secret of feature filmmaking. 10, 10, 10, 10. It's like, Act two is 2A, you know, act mm-hmm. two is, you know, you get 2A and 2B and they get split at a twist. Um, TV works the same way. Um, so you'd quirk all those 40 up 10, 10, 20, 10 or 10, 10, 10, 10, four times. Mm-hmm. Um, TV works the same way, but there's a lot less beats and it just depends. Um, my, the, the big thing I found in adapting Save the Cat it adapts fine to writing a pilot. It, it adapts great. I use it myself to write pilots. But what it doesn't adapt to and what I've pulled away is the beat sheet is more like a to-do list and less like a this must happen at page 12. This must happen at page 30. Because what you find is a show like The Mandalorian, that opening pitch, that cool scene in the beginning where he captures the person and 
I think there's a monster that attacks him in the desert. He flies away and they do the carbon freezing and all that stuff. That's like 12 minutes long. It's 12 minutes. So if you were doing a 10, 20, 10, and that was just your opening pitch, you'd, you'd blow up. It's like sucking up so much juice of your timeline that you'd be in big trouble. But what I found in television is they spend time where they need to spend time. A lot of times in pilots, it's the setup because they need to set up characters. They need to set up character art. They need to set up worlds. They need to set up all this stuff. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So you need all that time for the setup, the first act. But then sometimes Mandalorian is a perfect example. The fun and game section, which is the first part in, in, in Save the Cat terms, fun and games is the first part of act two. It's usually the promise of the premise. So if you're seeing a movie, it's like trailer moments. It's like the monster went wild or the people are on an adventure or something like that. But in The Mandalorian, because they they do all that cool stuff in the beginning, it's really small, like fun and games. Like he he, he ends up there. He, he has to tame the beast, that that creature, I think, to ride. Right. And, and, and him and the Ugnaught go off on the adventure. And that's kind of all they do for fun and games. It's really small and the midpoint twist and stuff like that happen afterwards. So they, in television, you as a writer have to pick and choose what gets the space. All the beats get hit, but they don't necessarily get all the space like in a regular feature where you say, you know, it's very rigid in a feature. It's like 10 for the first act, 20 right. for the second act, 10 for the fourth in a in a uh, save the cat television show, it could be it could be like I got five for the for the setup, I have three for Act Two, I have three for Act Two uh, B, and then I have two for the finale or something. You might do some weird combination, and I give a lot of guidance to that. It's it's sort of where um, it's sort of where true television writing comes into play because television writers. Often in writer's rooms, if you Google writer's rooms and you look up the Breaking Bad writer's rooms, what you'll see is these boards. You'll see note cards and boards. They live and breathe all uh, note cards and boards, even more than feature writers do. It's it's really how most of them break story. Now, do you need a show Bible? Uh, you don't need a show Bible. You don't need a show Bible. I do have a section where I tell you how to write a sort of a Bible light, which is a pitch document. Um, that's what most people have. Most people have the one, two punch of their pilot and some kind of five to 10 page pitch document that, you know, it sets up what season one will look like in a very high level, like a couple pages at most. It sets up who all the characters are. It, it tells what your personal, uh, connection is to the story. And that's the pitch document. But the truth of pitching television, pitching television is usually done uh, face to face. It's very rarely done. Like submit your pitch document to us. Um, I, I have you do that for preparation, but also to prepare in case you're called to, like somebody reads your pilot and it's time. They're like, Hey, we're bringing you in, you know, come on. You're, you're ready to go. If you have, if you do the pitch document I described in the book, which was given to me over many years from managers, studio execs, all that I'm kind of giving you the one they gave me. Um, you'll be ready to pitch. Nice. Now I'm going to ask you a few uh, questions to ask all my guests. What are three pilots everyone should read? Three pilots everyone should read. Wow. That, this should be an answer that's um, I'm rock solid ready. I it, the, the truth is I'm trying to be original, but Breaking Bad's pretty darn good. <laughs> um, I, I just can't get away from it. It's, right. It's, I mean, if it, if, if it, I mean, it's like Chinatown is Chinatown. I mean, you're going to have to Chinatown read it. Chinatown is it's, Chinatown. I mean, like Godfather's Godfather. I mean, you got to read it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the other one that comes to mind, and it's not in my book because it's an older one, is The Shield. I, I think oh, The Shield right. is a great right. pilot. It yeah. has this great ending uh, that throws you into the next week. It gives you everything about those characters, but it also gives you a beginning, middle, end story. So it feels kind of procedural, but then it also feels like um, it also feels like it's got a continuing story. You want to watch the next episode. You mm -hmm. want to get to the next episode. Um, and I'll, I'll take one from my book. One of the ones I really liked from my book was Barry's Pilot. It just mm -hmm. fits really well. It does a really efficient job 
of being exactly what it is, telling a surprising beginning, middle, end story, and setting up next week, all the while being um, thematic, um, character-driven. Uh, so I'm a big fan of the of the Barry one. I can't remember if I read the Barry one. I think I did. I think it's out there. I think you can get it because I think yeah, it was I up think there. It, I, um, I think you so can get it as well. I think it's out there. Now, what advice would you give a screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Uh, honestly, I mean, this is no joke. If you can, if you can swing it, television is the way. Um, and honestly, that's why I wrote this book because my students are going to television. I've been going to television for the last few years. Think television, uh, think about these pilots, um, try to get yourself a, a good pilot. Um, the other advice that I always give is you kind of have to prepare. You have to, um, make yourself better as much as you have to make your work better because it's it grind. Like we went over my history in the beginning of this. Um, if I told you it was going to take you seven, eight years before you get in the WGA, you got to be ready for that. You know, you got to be ready. And the way I got ready for it was I learned how to write five scripts and, and or six scripts a year, or 10 scripts a year. Um, I also had to like, understand failure and understand patience and understand all that stuff. So I'm a big fan of like figure out how you're going to endure the long journey as opposed to just find a way through the door, like set yourself up so that you can be persistent. So you can be persistent over a 20 year period and not like a wild person over a one month or one year period. Um, you know, set yourself up for the long term. Is what I'm saying. And what's the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Wow, that's a tough one. Because, um, you know, the lesson that took me the longest to learn in the film business is probably something I'm still needing to learn. That's that's. <laughs> That's the hard part about that question. <laughs> yeah, I get I get that answer quite a bit. I'm like, I'm still learning yeah. it. I'm like, but there's always stuff that, like I mean, for me, it's patience. It's always been patience for me. Like, yeah. I, it's gonna take it's gonna take twice as long, if not longer, than you ever expected to be. I sadly, I've learned patience. Not that it makes me happy, but I've learned <laughs> that um, honestly. I, and honestly, it feels like I've just been ground down to the numbness of patience. You know what I mean? It's like it's like I'm so numb. You have, the, no, uh, you have no choice in the matter. It's, the, it's, the, it's it, like it's an acceptance of the inevitable. It's that's all it is when you're like, I, I'm a patient person. No, you've just accepted the realities of the world. It's and in our business, my God, nothing moves fast. Nothing. Nothing moves fast. I and, and sometimes that slow move like right now I have, you know, three projects out there. Um, one is getting notes at a super slow pace. Um, the other is trying to attach a director at a molasses like pace because they're going to big directors and the other is trying to attach an actor at a molasses. So when I say attach an actor, it's like a situation where you send a script out, it goes to the agent, the agent takes a month to get back. Then they say yes or no. They usually say yes. And then it takes two months for the actor and you're waiting all that time to go to the next actor. Uh, so it's like the slow slog uh, of attachment. When I'm know? doing, when I'm doing projects now, I think of it as like, it's a three years, three to four year pro. Like I'm just, I, I, I walk in knowing that yeah. if I, it's going to be a three year, like, Oh yeah. In three or four years, it's going to get where I need it to be. <laughs> but so I, th this isn't really one that I'd say. So my lesson in regards to that, like how I've learned to deal with that, it's not a lesson. It's a weird lesson because I, I don't want to put pressure on people to do it this way. I've learned that the only way I can stomach that, the only way I can have patience, is by spinning lots and lots of plates. Um, that's why. Yeah. That's why I'm doing. That's why I'm doing Save the Cat rates for TV while I'm writing a pilot, while I'm pitching a TV show, while I'm doing, while I'm reading a novel. Um, if I don't have 10 plates spinning at a time in some way, I mean, one of them could be an old script that's out there that's spinning. You know what I mean? It could be like a five-year-old script that I've kind of re given rebirth to and sent to somebody. But if I don't have 10 things out there, I start getting anxiety. Uh, and that's part of what I'm saying for the long haul. Like think about the stuff you're doing now 
may not pay off for like seven years. I've had a bunch of scripts that didn't sell for like six or like I had managers that or or people that would say, I don't think I don't think this one's very good. And then it sold like seven years later. And it's not that they were wrong. It was just the market it wasn't its time. Yeah, the market right. changed. Um, so get those things going. Think about them long term. But the only way I find to deal with failure, not failure, but rejection and the, and the slow slog is to have so many things that today I'm talking to you and I'm talking about Save the Cat Rights for TV. I'm not thinking about all the rejections that are probably piling up in my email right now. Um, I'll think about those once we hang up and then I'll see that. <laughs> but I, I have like 50 things going on, but right now I can only focus on this thing. So it's a great way. The best way to, to you know, stem off that rejection, to stem off that, that impatience is to start something else, to keep moving, to keep spinning plates. So uh, I'm a, a juggler, great, by the way. So plate spinning is my great, thing. great, great advice. I, I do the same thing. I have so I actually have too many plates spinning uh, to the point where it gets a little out of hand. Uh, and people are like, how are you doing that? I'm like, I'm just built to do that. I have a thousand things going yeah, on a thousand times. And um, they're like, how many, how, how do you put out? Circle. It, 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 you yeah. know, it, it can be weird because you probably couldn't stop it now. That's your that no, I, like when I people are like, how do you put out four to like three to four podcasts fresh every week with four shows or something like that or five shows and something like that? And I'm like, I mean, if it was just one, I'd be bored. <laughs> like I could yeah. do one, I could do one episode a week in my sleep. Five is challenging. <laughs> <laughs> Are you telling me I'd have to sit with my own thoughts for a while? What, no, what you, you can't have any no. of that. No, no, stop that. That's yeah, not exactly. possible. Uh, and very last question, three of your favorite films of all time. Yeah, uh, this one, it's so funny. I keep changing this one for sure. some reason. All, all my movies, by the way, are ones I've realized are ones I've seen in theater as a kid. Like they're my favorites. Right? Fair enough. Um and unfortunately, I'm heavily in the Spielberg, Lucas. Fair team. enough. Hey, I was in that. Right? So I apologize for being lame as I'm about to be. So Raiders okay. of the Lost Ark is my number one favorite. Um, and th now I start switching. These are the ones I start switching back and forth. Um, back to the Future, I'll put it number two. I love Back to the Future. I like the mix of genres and the comedy. And then the third one is the one sometimes it's Robocop. Sometimes it's <sighs> Evil Dead 2. Sometimes it's nice. there's all these weird ones I mix back and forth. Um, I'm trying to remember one I said the other day. And sometimes it's Star Wars, the first Star Wars. We don't call it a New Hope in this house. No, uh, obviously not. No, it's just it's just um, it's Star Wars. Yes. yes. So it's it's and sometimes it's Aliens. And I mix and match all, all, all of those. Good. I saw all them all in the theater. All good. and I can't. It's it's strange because even Back to the Future sometimes slides back to three and something else is like an ET is another one. I mean, there's so many jaws. Um, but today I'm going to go with uh, I'll just go with Star Wars because that'll make fair, fair enough. Better. Fair enough. I mean, you got a Mandalorian. Go. I mean, you don't have to go too far with me. Uh, now, where can uh, people find out more about you and where can they buy the book? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, the probably the best place to see me is on Twitter. Um, I'm at Jamie underscore Nash. Uh, I respond there. I do a lot of goofy messages, uh, sign up, follow me a lot of save the cat kind of stuff too. A lot of writer stuff. So if you're into writing stuff, um, I, I'm definitely involved in the writer writing community on Twitter. So please follow me. I'd love to have any interaction. Uh, and, uh, you can buy the book on Amazon. Uh, that's the usual go-to place, but you can buy it anywhere that sells books. Um, it's it's in the bar. It's in a couple Barnes and Nobles. It's funny. I'm I'm constantly tracking like when's it going to show up at my Barnes and Noble? Like it's in it's in like four places in Maryland uh, where I live, but it's not in the one that's right across the street from my house. I'm kind of <laughs> angry about it. I want it there. Um, so, uh, but you can buy it. You can buy it anywhere you buy books. And the audio book is about to drop this week. Uh, or I don't know this week. They get, it, Amazon says thirty days, and it was, oh no, it takes forever. Takes forever yeah, for thirty days runs out like this week or next week. So soon, soon right. will be an audiobook if you prefer that. And some people do. Jamie, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a very educational conversation. I, I really feel that you were channeling Blake when you were writing this book because a lot of the things that you're saying ring so save the cat in the way that you're presenting the information in a very simple, um, easy to understand 
method, which is what Save the Cat is so brilliant and what Blake was so brilliant at doing. So uh, congratulations on the new book and hopefully it'll help a few writers out there. So thanks again, my friend. Yeah, thank you. I want to thank Jamie for coming on the show and dropping his knowledge bombs on the tribe today. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including how to get Save the Cat Rights for TV, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 120. And if you haven't already, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com and leave a honest and good review, hopefully, for the show. It really helps us out a lot. Thank you again so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 